Hello, good morning, and happy Saturday. Welcome in exploration of the adventures and voyage of the history and evolution, culture and heritage of English liter literature. And this is the sustenance of the Anglo-Saxon period recurring to the previously broadcasted podcast and this is my ardent and fervent privilege indeed to be an anorak and a numismatist and a compellingly passionate and enthusiast reader We have in the suggestive questions what is meant by Northumbrian literature, who are the great Northumbrian writers, what besides the Danish conquest caused the decline of Northumbrian literature, and telling this, narrating the story of Cademan as recorded in the Bades, in Bade's history, and what new element is introduced in Cademan's poems? What effect did Christianity have upon Anglo-Saxon literature? And however, we have extended allu allusions towards it. Can you quote any passages from Cademan to show that Anglo-Saxon character was not changed but given a new direction? And if you have read Milton's Paradise Lost, what resemblances are there between that poem and Cademan's paraphrase? And what are the Sinovol poems and the extension part towards alluding to, to the citation, describing any that we have read, or how do they compare in spirit and in expression with Beowulf and with Cademan? Reading the Phoenix, which is a translation from the Latin in Brooks' History of Early English Literature, or in Glon's Golan's Exeter book, or in Cook's translation from Old English Poetry, and telling what elements we do find in to show that the poem is not of Anglo Saxon origin, and comparing the views of nature in Beowulf and in the Sinewolf poems. These are the highlighted contexts that I would be speaking in this momentous occasion. And here we begin. Christian writers of the Anglo Saxon period. The literature of this period falls naturally into two divisions pagan and Christian. The former represents the poetry which the Anglo-Saxons probably brought with them in the form of oral sagas, the crude material out of which literature was slowly developed on English soil. The latter represents the writings developed under teaching of the monks after the old pagan religion had vanished. But while it still re retained its hold on the life and language of the people, in reading our earlier poetry, it is well to remember that all of it was copied by the monks and seems to have been more or less altered to give it a religious coloring. Okay? The coming of Christianity meant not simply a new life and leader for England, it meant also the wealth of a new language. The scope is now replaced by the literary monk, and that monk, though he lives among common people and speaks with the English tongue, has behind him all the culture and literary resources of the Latin language. The effect is seen instantly in our early prose and poetry.
and um, Northumbrian literature in general two great schools of Christian influence came into England and speedily put an end to the frightful wars that had waged continually among the various petty kingdoms of the Anglo-Saxons and um, the first of these under the leadership of Augustine came from Rome. It spread in the south and center of England, especially in the kingdom of Essex. It founded schools and partially educated the rough people, but it produced no lasting literature. We have here a portrait or painting of the manuscript, the book. Let me focus so that we, we would be having a glimpse. Okay, the other under the leadership of the saintly Adrian came from Ireland, which country had been for centuries a center of religion and education for all Western Europe. The monks of this school labored chiefly in Northumbria, and to their influence we owe all that is best in Anglo-Saxon literature. It is called the Northumbrian School. Its center was the monasteries and abbeys, which as Jarrow and Whiteby and its three greatest names are Bed, Cademon and Sinewolf. We have here Bade 673 till 735, the venerable Bade as he is generally called, our first great scholar and the father of our English learning, wrote almost exclusively in Latin his last work, the translation of the Gospel of John into Anglo-Saxon. Having been unfortunately lost, much to our regret therefore, his books and the story of his gentle heroic life must be excluded from the history of our literature. His works, over 40 in number, covered the whole field of human knowledge in his day and were so admirably written that they were widely copied as textbooks or rather manuscripts in nearly all the monastery schools of Europe. The work of the most important to us is the ecclesi ecclesiastical history of the English people. It is a fascinating history to read even now with its curious combination of accurate scholarship and immense credulity. In all strictly historical matters, Babe is a model. Every known authority on the subject, from Pliny to Gildas, was carefully considered. Every learned pilgrim to Rome was commissioned by Babe to ransack the archives and to make copies of papal decrees and royal letters, and to these were added the testimony of abbots who could speak from personal knowledge of events or repeat the traditions of their several monasteries. This was the first history of England. Side by side with this historical exactness are marvelous stories of saints and missionaries. It was an age of credulity and miracles where in men's mind continually the men of whom he wrote lived lives, lived lives more wonderful than any romance, and their courage and gentleness made a tremendous impression on the rough, warlike people to whom they come with open hands and hearts. It is the natural way of all primitive peoples to magnify the works of their heroes, and so deeds of heroism and kindness which were part of the daily life of the Irish missionaries were soon transformed into the miracles of the saints. Bade believed these things as all other men did and records them with charming simplicity just as he received them from bishop or abbot. 
notwithstanding its errors we owe to this work great nearly to all our knowledge of the eight centuries of our history following the landing of caesar in britain okay okay mon the 17th century now we must we now must we him the master of heaven the might of the maker the deeds of the father the thought of his heart he lord everlasting established of long old the source of all wonders creator all holy he hung the bright heaven a roof high unprepared over the children of men the king of mankind that created for mortals the world in its beauty the earth spread beneath them he lord everlasting omnipotent god so cadman's hymn cook's version in translation from old english poetry if beowulf and the fragments of our earliest poetry were brought into england <coughs> then the hymn given above is the first verse of all native english song that has come down to us and cadman is the first poet to whom we can give a definite name and date the words were written about 665 ad and are found copied at the end of a manuscript of bates ecclesiastical history life of cadman what little we know of cadman the anglo-saxon milton as he is probably called is taken from bates account of ecclesiastical history of the abbess abbess hilda and of her monastery at whitby and where here is a free and condensed translation of bates history there was in the monastery of abbess hilda a brother distinguished by the grace of god for that he could make poems treading of goodness and religion whatever was translated to him for he could not read of sacred scripture he shortly reproduced in poetic form of great sweetness and beauty none of all english poets could equal him for he learned not the art of song from men nor sang by the arts of men rather did he receive all his poetry as a free gift from god and for this reason he did never compose poetry of a vain or worldly kind until of mature age he lived as a layman and had never learned any poetry indeed no ignorant so ignorant of singing was he that sometimes at a feast where it was the custom that for the pleasure of all his guest should sing in turn he would praise from the table when he saw the harp coming to him and go home ashamed now it happened once that he did this thing at a certain festivity and went out to a stall to the stall to care for the horses their duty been assigned being assigned to him for that night as he slept at the usual time one stood by him saying cadman sing me something i cannot sing he answered and that is why i came i came hither from the feast but he who spake unto him said again cadman sing to me and he said what shall i sing and he said sing the beginning of created things there upon cadman began to sing verses that he had never heard before of these import now should we praise the power and wisdom of the creator the works of the father this is the sense but not the form of the hymn that he sang while sleeping when he awakened cadman remembered the words of the hymn and he added to them many more in the morning he went to the steward of the monastery lands and showed him the gift he had received in sleep the steward brought him to hilda who made him repeat to the monks the hymn he had composed and all agreed that the grace of god was upon cadman and to taste him they expounded to him a bit of scripture from the latin and bade him if he could to turn it into poetry he went away humbly and returned in the morning with an excellent poem thereupon hilda received him and his family into the monastery made him one of the brethren and commanded that the whole course of bible history be expounded to him and 
He in turn, reflecting upon what he had heard, transformed it into most delightful poetry, and by echoing it back to the monks in more melodious sounds, made his teachers his listeners. In all his this his arm was his aim was to turn men from wickedness and to help them to love and practice of well doing. Then follows a brief record of Cademan's life and an exquisite picture of his death amidst the brethren. And so it came to pass, says the simple record, that as he served God while living in purity of mind and serenity of spirit, so by a peaceful death he left the world and went to look upon his face. So he had deserted the world and, deceived, and had been deceased with the purity of mind and the serenity of spirit. Cademan's work, works. The greatest work attributed to Cademan is that the so-called paraphrase. It is the story of the Genesis, the Exodus, and the part of Daniel told in glowing poetic language with the power of insight and imagination which often raises it from paraphrase into the realm of true poetry. Though we have Bates' assurance that Cademan transformed the whole course of Bible history into most delightful poetry, no work known certainly to have been composed by him has come down to us. In the 17th century, this Anglo-Saxon paraphrase was discovered and then attributed to Cademan and his name is still associated with it, <coughs> though it is now almost certain that the paraphrase is the work of more than one writer. Aside from the doubtful question of authorship, even a casual reading of the poem brings us into the presence of a poet, a rude indeed, but with a genius strongly suggestive at the times of the matchless Milton. The book opens with a hymn of praise and then tells of the, of the fall of Satan and his rebel angels from heaven, which is familiar to us in Milton's Paradise Lost. Then follows the creation of the world and the paraphrase begins to thrill with the old Anglo-Saxon love of nature. Here first the eternal Father, God of all, of heaven and earth raised up the firmament, the Almighty Lord set firm by his strong power, this roomy land, grass greened, not yet the plain, ocean for spread, hid the wan ways in gloom. Then was the spirit gloriously bright of heaven's keeper born over the deep, swiftly the life giver, the angel's lord. Over the ample ground bade came forth, come forth light, quickly the high king's bidding was obeyed. Over the ways that there shone light's holy ray, then parted, he, Lord of triumphant might, shadow from shining darkness from the light, light by the word of God, whose first named day, from the Genesis 112 till 131, Molay's version, version. And after recounting the story of paradise, the fall and the deluge, and the paraphrases, continued in this in the exodus with the fall and the deluge and the paradise of all which the poet makes a noble epic rushing on with the sweep of saxon army to battle a single selection is given here to show how the poet adapted the story to his hearers thus we read then they saw forth and forward firing pharaoh's war array gliding on a groove of spears glittering the hosts Fluttered there the banners, there the folk, the folk, the marsh trod. Onward surged the war, strode the spears along, blickered the broad shields, blew aloud the trumpets. Wheeling round in gyres, yelled the fowls of war. Of the battle, greedy, hoarsely burnt the raven, dew upon his feathers over the fallen corpses. Sword that chooser of the slain, slang aloud the wolves and eve their horrid song, hoping for the carrion. From Exodus 155, from Brugge's version. And besides the paraphrase, we have a few fragments of the same general character and which are attributed to the school of Kedemon. The longest of these is Judith. Judith, in which the story of an apocryphal book of Old Testament 
is done into vigorous poetry. Holofernes is represented as a savage and cruel Viking, revealing in his mind mad hole, and when the heroic Judith cuts off his head with his own sword and throws it down before the warriors of her people, rousing them to battle and victory, we reach perhaps the most dramatic and brilliant point of Anglo-Saxon literature. So we have here Sinowulf in this context with the 8th century of Sinowulf, the greatest of Anglo-Saxon poets, excepting only the unknown author of Beowulf. We know very little. Indeed, it was not till 1840, more than a thousand years after his death, posthumous publication uh, of that obscured and languished manuscript, that even his name became known. Though he is the only one of our early poets who signed his works, the name was never plainly written, but woven into verses in the form of secret forms, suggesting a modern charade, but more difficult of interpretation until one has found the key to the poet's signature. Works of Sinawulf. The only signed poems of Sinawulf for the Christ, the Juliana, the Fates of the Apostles, and Eileen. Unsigned poems attributed to him or his school are Andreas and the Phoenix. Phoenix. And the Dream of the Rude and the Descent into Hell, Gothlack and the Wanderer and some of the readers. The last are the simply literary con conundrums of, in which some well-known object like the bow or drinking horn is described, described in poetic language and the hearer must guess the name. Some of them like the swan and the storm spirit are usually beautiful. And we have here tones where primitive letters of the old northern alphabet. This is the annotation. In a few passages, Sinovolf uses each tone to represent not only a letter but a word beginning with that letter. Thus, the Rung equivalent of C stands for for keen, courageous, wife, or evil in the sense of wretched, and N for need, need, W for joy, one, and U earn for our, R, L for lagulate, and F for pure, P and wealth, using the runes equivalent to these seven letters, signable pipes. At the same time, reveals his name in certain verses of the Christ. Then the courage hearted quakes when the King Lord he hears sticks to those he once on earth but obeyed him weakly. While as yet their yearning pain and their need most easily comfort him discovereth. Gone is then the winsomeness of the earth's adornments. What to use as men belonged of the joys of life was locked long ago in lake flood of all the fee, all the fee on earth. Of all these words, the most characteristic is undoubtedly the Christ, a didactic poem in three parts. The first, the celebration, celebrating the nativity, the second, the ascension, and the third, the doomsday. Telling the torments of the wicked and the unending joy of the redeemed, Sinawulf takes his subject matter partly from the church liturgy, but more largely from the homilies of Gregory the Great. The whole is well woven together and contains some hints of great beauty and many passages of intense dramatic form. Throughout the poem, a deep love for Christ and a reverence for the Virgin Mary are manifest. More than any other poems in any language, the Christ reflects the spirit of early Latin Christianity. Here is a fragment comparing life to a sea voyage, a, compa a comparison which occurs sooner or later to every thoughtful person and which finds perfect expression in Tennyson's Crossing the Bar. Now tea is most like as if we fare in ships on the ocean flood over the water cold driven our driving our vessels through the spacious seas with horses of the dip a perilous way is this of boundless waves and there are stormy seas 
on which we toss here in this reeling world over the deep paths, ours was a sorry plight. And we have, my robe is noiseless while I tread the earth, our tarry need the banks, or start the shallows. But when these shining wings, this depth of air, bear me aloft above the bending shores, when men abide and for the welcome strength of the multitudes conveys me, then, with rushing wire and clear, melodious sound, my raiment sings, and like a wandering spirit, I float unweariedly over flood and field. From Brahman's version in translation from Old English poetry. Until at last we sailed into the land over the troubled main, help came to us that brought us to the heaven of salvation, God, Spirit, God, and Son, and granted grace to us that we might know and know and from the vessel's deck where we must bind with anchorage secure our ocean steeds, old stallions of the waves. And we have here Andreas and Elin. In the two epic poems of Andreas and Elin, Sinewolf, if he be the author, which is the very summit of his poetical art, Andreas, an unsigned poem, records the story of St. Andrews, who crosses the sea to rescue his comrade St. Matthew from the cannibals. A young master of who sails the boat turns out to be Christ in disguise. Matthew is set free and the savages are converted by a miracle. And the sources of Andreas is an early Greek legend of St. Andrew that found its way to England and was probably known to Sinewolf in some brief Latin form now lost. It is a spirited poem full of rush and incident and the descriptions of the sea are the best in Anglo-Saxon poetry. Elaine has for its subject matter the finding of the true cross it tells of the constant times vision of the rood on the eve of battle after his victory under the new emblem he sends his mother helena helene to jerusalem in search of the original cross and the nails the poem which is of very uneven quality might properly be put at the end of sinewolf's works he adds to the poem a personal note signing his names in runes and if we accept the wonderful vision of the Rood as Sinovold's work, we learn how we found the cross at last in his own heart. There is a suggestion here of the future Sir Lonfell and the search for the Holy Grail. And the decline of the Northumbrian literature, the same northern energy which had built up learning and literature so rapidly in Northumbria, was instrumental in pulling it down towards the end of the century in which Sinewolf lived, the Danes swept down on the English coasts and overwhelmed Northumbria. Monasteries and schools were destroyed, and scholars and teachers alike were put to sword and libraries that had been gathered leaf by leaf with the toil of creatures were scattered to the four winds. And so all true Northumbrian literature perished with the exception of a few fragments and that which now we now possess. Our two chief sources are the famous Exeter book in Exeter Cathedral, a collection of Anglo-Saxon poems presented by Bishop Leofric with 150 and the Versili book discovered in the monastery of Versili, Italy in 1822, the only known manuscript of Beowulf was discovered in 16, 16th century and is now in the Cotton Library of the British Museum. All these are fragmentary copies and show the marks of fire and of herd usage. The Exeter book contains the Christ, Gothlag, the Phoenix, Phoenix, and the Juliana, and the 
wide widths and the seafarer and the doers lament and the wives complain the lovers message and 95 riddles and many short hymns and fragments as astonishing variety for a single manuscript and is a largely a translation in the dialect of the west saxons this translation was made by alfred scholars after he had driven back the danes in an effort to preserve the ideals and the civilization that had been so hardly won with the conquest of northumbria ends the poetic period of anglo-saxon literature with alfred the great of wessex our prose literature makes a beginning Thank you very much. Adieu and farewell. And I verily hope to see you very soon with upcoming lecture on Alfred. Goodbye. Have a pleasant day.